Today is August 27 of 2014. We're going to take a look at uh, Benedict de Spinoza and his uh, most important work, his Ethics, which he wrote in 1677. That was uh, the year of his death. He uh, This work was published immediately after his death. He uh, worked in a secular position grinding optical lenses and uh, turned down a professorship at Heidelberg. So he was a, a, a Jewish philosopher of note, and he did have offers of uh, positions in universities, but he turned them down and instead decided to stay in the secular world and uh, worked as a tradesman. In uh, 1677, his ethics was the presentation of his entire system, and it is an entire systems of system representing the ontology of substance. And it, for Spinoza, everything is one so, enclosed within one substance. All of uh, existence is uh, simply the uh, emanating uh, particular modalities of the one substance, and existence contains a tension between the active nature of the attributes of substance and the passive nature of the modalities of substance. So you and I live within a tension in existence between these uh, spirit attributes and these uh, passive modalities. There's a, a continual tension of this trajectory of spirit which consists of the trajectory of the uh, attributes of the one substance, and they're working their way through what we would call finite modalities, but there really is no finitude in Spinoza because everything is infinite, everything is eternal because it is all enclosed within the one infinite and the one eternal substance. So there is no, I guess you should understand that right up front, there is no concept of finitude, and there is no concept of contingency in Spinoza at all. They're not in his uh, vocabulary. So his lexicon does not contain finitude or contingency. And actually, the only time contradiction can be used as a concept is when we mistakenly identify contradictions in our understanding. The... Uh, existence that we live in and the existence we face is to be universally affirmed. All of existence is to be universally affirmed. There is no negotiation on this point with Spinoza. All of creation is to be universally affirmed. It is all universally enclosed within the one, what he calls God substance, or the one spirit substance. In other words, everything is eternal. Everything is Spirit. Everything is a, either an expression of the attributes of spirit or it is an emanating expression of the modalities of spirit in particularization. So Spinoza, in order to form an ethic, tells us that everything is going to uh, evolve according to the necessity of the nature of this spirit substance. Nothing can uh, evolve contrary to it. It's impossible. So everything is going to emanate according to the trajectory of the spirit substance. And our ethic simply means humanity needs to get on board and artic artic form and articulate an understanding where we truly grasp this uh, order of the attributes, this order of this uh, active and passive activity. In other words, we want to write the ontology. We want to write the what he calls the phraseology. We want to write the uh, overarching ontology of spirit, or what he would call the overarching ontology of substance. And we do that by developing uh, from sen sense experience to perception, and from perception to understanding, from understanding to articulating the notion of the true, 
and from the articulating of the notion of the true to developing a true phraseology using concepts and signs to form an ontology of substance. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it should. That is Hegel to a T. That is the uh, Hegelian dialectic. And uh, Hegel's book was entitled, what, The Phenomenology. This is a phenomenology uh, of Spinoza, but it is a pre-Hegelian phenomenology. Now, Hegel gave credit to Spinoza, so this don't accuse him of stealing it. He did credit Spinoza for this insight, but Hegel built on Spinoza's system. Spinoza formed this first ontological Trinitarian dialectic, which he called the phraseology of substance. He called it the phraseology of substance. Now, later we call it the ontology of spirit, according to Hegel, but uh, initially it, uh, Spinoza, Spinoza termed it the phraseology of substance. So we're going to write a phraseology of substance, and we're going to do that by developing a phenomenology. He takes the approach that everything is to be discovered in existence, which postmoderns love. Postmoderns, by the way, really like Spinoza. But everything is to be taken from existence because everything, everything in existence is an emanating presence of attribute and modality. We are looking at spirit when we look at finitude we're looking at in his terms we're looking at absolute substance when we look at uh, our existence our finite existence so we encounter God in nature we encounter ourselves in nature we encounter the aletheia truth in nature we encounter uh, the trajectory and the teleological direction of our lives and the lives of history and the life of nature itself, all within the context of natural existence. We need not go further. Everything is discoverable there. And if we are informed by written sources, they are previous attempts at uh, the phraseology of substance. And those attempts at a phraseology of substance can be taken up to inform us in a, a workspace that we create for our understanding, for our ongoing understanding, because he calls this a process of addition. We are to continually add to our understanding so we can reach a higher and higher perfection of articulating this phraseology of substance, of articulating this ontology. We will grow in our awareness of the ontology. We will grow in our own specific articulations. We will be informed by other articulations, other phraseologies, this could include something like uh, Jewish literature, Christian literature, uh, secular literature. It all can be included, but uh, it's all an in-process work of working toward this affirmation of all existence by articulating a phraseology of substance. So when we take a look at uh, Spinoza, he begins with uh, saying that, first of all, in secular society, he sees three major concerns. We're concerned for riches, for fame, or for sensual pleasure. The result of this is a general melancholy. It's not we're not generally not a happy people. Usually there's a, a sense of melancholy in our existence. There's a sense of adult intellect. Our concepts are perishable and changing constantly. We don't really have uh, any possession of anything of an infinite or eternal concepts. Instead we settle for the uh, the perishable concepts. And there's a quest by every self for recognition, for some sense of recognition. So he says the current ethics that we kind of face today is that uh, an ideal human character is formed and posited as our goal, and that is to be in harmony with the laws of nature, and we are to strive toward a unity of mind and nature. And it's all governed by provisional laws. That's kind of where we're at. We're kind of in the sense of melancholy and with a real desire for recognition and uh, a realm where our ethics is really composed of perishable concepts. So it's a pretty negative uh, existential view of reality, which uh, postmoderns would certainly agree with. But uh, his view of current civil existence is pretty poor. 
poor vision. So, in order to take up his quest for this phraseology of substance, of the one eternal substance, we begin with perception. Now, um, he says that there is a realm of signification already in existence in our reality. There are signs that have already been created and already in existence. Experience itself gives us uh, the experience of sensate exchange. We do have a sensate exchange of uh, all of these sensory attributes. And there is the realm of analogy, where there is uh, an identification of properties and objects through the work of analogy. So we do practice the work of signification. We do uh, tabulate the work of experience. And we do uh, intellectually get involved and reflectively get involved in the work of analogy. So signification, experience, and analogy. And we're all trying to seek essence through reflective knowledge. Now the quest for Spinoza says that first there's an awareness of limit point. How far the ideal can really be achieved in this sensate realm of sensory knowledge. We do reach limit point. And so secondly, uh, we do initiate an intention for acquiring true essence. And we need to do this by making instrumental um, instruments for the intellect. We'll do it through a process of uh, actually developing intellectual tools. Now he has some axioms that he wants to put forth for acquiring this notion of the true because essentially that's what he's telling us is we're, we're going to try to seek essence and go beyond limit point. If we're going to seek essence and go beyond limit point, what are the general axioms we can take up? Number one, uh, an idea can be real, although not actual. Uh, it can exist as a true essence, even though it isn't actualized. We ascertain essence by investigating the nature, the nature of an individual particular object. We follow the rules of acquisition. Subject, subjective ideas are gathered in a synchrony, uh, in a harmony. And uh, this is a product of reflective work, the reflective intellect. is critiqued by the given true idea of the most perfect being that is innately present in every individual self. Spinoza believes that the innate idea of the most perfect being and the given true idea exist within the individual as a given. That's a part of you because you are uh, an extension of the one substance. So innately within you, you possess an idea of the given, an initial idea of the given true idea. It may not have a lot of content, but you have the uh, abstract innate given true idea. Now through the methodology of analogy and correspondence and comparison, we will work toward acquiring this essence, this notion of the true, and it will lead to an overall synchrony of the order of nature according to Spinoza. We will eventually reach a synchrony of order for all of these attributes and essences that we will acquire. So the relation will be self-manifested from the one substance. We will negate current misinterpretations. We will negate the idea of contingency completely. And we will negate the idea of contradiction uh, in all of our pursuit toward these true essences, these true attributes of the one substance. So you can see he's enclosing everything within the infinite. We negate uh, completely any input from contingency. Now, this allows Spinoza to say, well, we, our first formulation, uh, we want to make as clear and distinct. We want to make clear and distinct positings. And that means we negate the sensate fictions uh, that emphasize only existence and to emphasize the objective over the subjective, uh, where sensate sense is taking priority, where a external cause is really the only thing that's considered for form, and there's an ignorance of essence. We must negate that sensate realm, that sensate realm of 
knowledge and its limit point. Spinoza says we take up understanding over sensate fiction. So fiction is overcome by understanding. We analyze simple and complex objects. Now, Spinoza says simple objects are always known as clear and distinct. Complex objects are divided into their simple components, and then they can be acquired as clear and distinct. So it's kind of, think of it this way, it's very similar to Wittgenstein and his uh, atomic and molecular propositions. Uh, an atomic proposition can be apprehended as clear and distinct. A complex must be broken down into its components so that it may be acquired as the, the pure and the distinct. The clear and the, and the distinct. So the goal is to, uh, in a way, deconstruct our current existence down into its singularities and all the way down to the singularities where they can be grasped as clear and distinct. So there is a process, process of deconstruction or reductionism that Spinoza proposes which again is very compatible with postmodernism. That's why they like him. He does propose this reductionism or this deconstruction to reach the singularities that can be grasped as clear and distinct. Now the discernment we discern the true by investigating the intrinsic natures and the methodology of uh, dialectically engaging in the actual reality to investigate these natures. Now, the essence is always known in itself as a true and subjective knowledge acquires the form of essence. So it's always acquired through subjective reflection. Subjective reflection will acquire these essences of the one substance. So we reflectively will discern the essence of an object and it's a furthest reduced form where it can be taken as clear and distinct and then uh, we will initiate the preliminary names uh, constructions through the imagination and we end up with four partitioned areas for our consideration the existing signification that already exists the sensate sense that informs our limit point the realm of imagination where we can construct our first names and the innate given true idea that we possess because we are part of the emanating one eternal substance. So the first abstractions we form are in process and uh, they're to be taken as continually critiqued through reductionism and analogy. So they're only a very provisional first conceptual abstractions and they're going to be uh, liable to additional critique through uh, deconstruction and an analogy, reductionism and analogy. So this will continue uh, until we can refine these concepts to a more pure or what he would call an absolute state. So we have a preliminary lexicon we have a preliminary lexical content that we acquire through perception. Perception reaches preliminary concepts. So there is some abstraction that takes place in the imagination at the psyche level. Now we transition out of the psyche to community because we have our singular lexical content and we want to share that with other individuals who also hold their own singular lexical content and by that way we can kind of refine things through analogy and come up with a uh, first emergence of form because perception gives us a preliminary lexical content and community or the decunta threshold gives us a preliminary form of substance so content lexical content through perception and form of substance through de Kunta critical dialogue. Now dialogue takes up two areas. Uh, 
It will take up dialog itself, but it also takes up memory. Now in dialog, the critical dialog is to resolve all doubt of our lexical content. We confront alternate ideas in other selves. We criti critique each other through the standard of the reductionism to the clear and the distinct. The uh, deconstruction and reductionism to the clear and distinct is the critical method of dialogue. Reductionism to the clear and distinct is the critical method of the Takunta threshold critical dialogue. In this way, we uh, eliminate any doubt we might have toward the synchrony of these initial names. Because we're trying to find a, a harmony, a synchrony of concepts, and this dialogue will help us to eliminate that doubt. Now, memory contributes to this process because Spinoza says intelligibility and the intensity of memory are proportionally re related. Therefore, our memory contains our most intelligent content. So memory is a very positive area of an added workspace. And uh, form becomes an emerging presence out of remembered content. So we're involved in kind of a twofold dialectic. We have a dialectic with other individuals at the Takunta threshold who are um, standing in with the same purpose as we are. We are engaging in mutual deconstruction and mutual reductionism in order to reach the clear and the distinct names, the clear and distinct preliminary abstract concepts. And we also are involved in a dialectic with the clear and the distinct that we keep carrying back to memory, but memory is always kind of working on uniting the clear and the distinct into a provisional synchrony, a provisional harmony of concepts. So we have a, a dualistic dialectic. We have a dialectic within a dialectic. An internal dialectic between um, psyche and memory, which in Hegel, remember he called that the mechanical memory, where all of the lexical content is stored, and out of that is where form emerges. Hegel called it the mechanical memory because it was just a mechanical storing of the lexicon. Well, here it's uh, just labeled memory, but or intellectual memory. But it is, uh, again, Spinoza says we will engage with the intellectual memory that holds our lexical content, and we'll go back and forth between the threshold of critical dialogue to the internal dialogue with the uh, provisional concepts until finally... We overcome, this whole process is to overcome doubt until finally we reach a point where we can be satisfied with overcoming doubt and we can actually uh, feel com comfortable with positing a preliminary synchrony of concepts. So we emerge out of psyche to enter into dialogue. We emerge out of dialogue with a preliminary form, a preliminary synchrony, and we're now ready to construct our first idea of the notion of the true. We're ready to put together that first initial diagram of our phraseology. It's not the phraseology. The phraseology will come later when we actually want to take it into uh, reality and share it with others. That will need to be put together as a narrative, uh, a narrative of phrases, a phraseology. So he does believe in the Derrida writing as the ultimate goal, but before we get to writing, we have to kind of diagram the synchrony of concepts. That's the formation of the notion of the true. Now, the first uh, area, we bring our memory with us. We arrive with a memory containing uh, the content of the temporary abstractions of the uh, intrinsic essences. We bring a strengthened form now, and uh, not a weakened form that's weakened by doubt. We bring a strengthened form, and we bring temporary abstractions. And we're ready now to enter into what Spinoza says is the process to legitimize these preliminaries. We need to legitimize the preliminaries. Now we take up uh, the imaginary words of memory and we subject, subject them to a refinery work of understanding and reason. So now we're going to enter into the reflective work of understanding and reason. And he says uh, 
we must uh, ensure that the names become clear and distinct. They must participate in a unity of ideas. They must be self-existent or caused by the proximate cause of substance itself, the primary the primary uh, emanations out of substance, what he would call primary attributes that uh, function to uh, work through the uh, modalities. And so initially, Spinoza is saying, the first thing we're going to do is formulate the primary attributes. We're going to arrive at the, uh, the fundamental overarching general primary attributes that will inform the entire system. We will have sub-concepts that will uh, form under these primaries, but obviously when we put together our initial um, diagram, we're going to begin with the primaries. So primary attributes are articulated first, and we follow a series of rules and he says uh, we define these concepts uh, through the idea of proximate cause being the one substance and the properties should be able to be deduced from the definition that we form of the attribute and it should be an affirmative positing, an affirmative sign. Now, it goes on to say that uh, we will reach true essence for our, our first diagram. We seek the particular the, uh, to define being behind all things. To define being behind all things, behind, behind all particular modalities. And then we will eventually acquire this essence as a series in harmony. And... Uh, there will be a series that will uh, enclose particulars that can now be taken as universals because we're going to uh, articulate each particular's universal essence. So it'll be a, a series of universals arranged in a synchronous harmony. A series of universals arranged in a synchronous harmony. And that will be our first preliminary diagram of the notion of the true that's going to inform our intellectual understanding which out of necessity is going to inform our phraseology of narrative that we will take into the actuality. So Spinoza says there is a, in forming this notion of the true we end up forming a, the, a revealing underlying truth of the affirmative essences. There is an an underlying truth that encloses these affirmative essences that we discover. And he says it's a self-manifestation. It speaks to certainty. It is a formation of absolute ideas. They are positive ideas, not negative. Uh, they uh, exist as a condi condition of eternity, enclosing all of the particular modalities. And the clear and the, the distinct rely on human subjectivity. It is a subjective model. So the final step, Spinoza says, is after forming the notion of the true, we can now um, negate or dismiss the perception content, and the concepts and the signs can stand on their own. So now we have a, a synchronous harmony of concepts that can stand on their own, and represent their own power and their own reality uh, as a subjective presence that out of necessity will inform our volition and our ethic and especially will inform our narrative phraseology of essence because we are going to write after we have the idea, the notion, we can engage in writing. And what we're going to write, according to Spinoza, is uh, we would call an ontology. We're going to write an ontology. Uh, Spinoza says we're going to call it a phraseology. We're going to write a phraseology. Uh, I guess he said that because the emphasis is on narrative. We're not going to write a diagram and share that diagram. We're going to have to uh, 
defend that diagram. We're going to have to defend it with a narrative. We're going to have to we're going to have to present a story. We're going to have to present a narrative. So narrative and the phraseology of narrative is the true goal of the ethic for Spinoza. It's an ethic of writing. Now the ethic of writing participates in a triad ontology. And the triad ontology for Spinoza is, I'll give you just a summary first, substance, and we can call this a spirit substance, spirit substance in itself, and then two, spirit substance gone out of itself as extended substance, and then three, spirit substance returning to itself as conceptual phraseology. So it's going to be substance, and then extended substance, and then the articulation of substance as a phraseology. So you've got it, it's just the substance itself, and then its extension, and then its, uh, its narration. Substance, extension, narration. Substance, extension, narration. If you can put those three in your head, it's a good way to kind of like remember Spinoza. Substance, substance extension, narration. Now, if we look at substance in itself, uh, eternity equals one substance. It re represents the substance of eternal truth. Understanding forms the substance of truth by examining the objective modes of expression in finitude. Substance is self-caused. It's uh, necessarily infinite. Um, external modifications are expressed as the concepts that we write. And the number of concepts must be shown and defended concerning that precise number. We have to defend that which we posit. There's one substance of the same nature. There are many particular attributes of the one substance, which is each in itself. And substance is expressed as attributes of infinite essence. Attributes of infinite essence that become uh, primary attributes. And substance is indivisible. So in other words, the reality you look at is really a distributed substance as extension and thought. We live in a distributed substance as extension and thought. Extended modalities and thought is uh, one of thought. Thinking is one of the uh, infinite attributes, according to Spinoza. So our thinking... And our pausing and our work here in reality is all the work of the spirit substance. Thinking is an innate presence that we have given to us by the one spirit substance. And it is an attribute of substance. It is an attribute of spirit. Thinking is an attribute of spirit. Now, too, uh, if we look at this extended substance... Um, it cannot be divided. It is a whole organism. It's the only, it is only diversely modified into particular modes of extension. All particulars exist within the spirit substance. All particulars follow the trajectory of the infinite nature of God or the infinite nature of spirit. The trajectory is one of necessity. Necessity. There is no contingency in his system. The trajectory is one of necessity. Therefore, all particulars fall within the sphere of the infinite intellect. The number of particulars is also a necessity. Now, the spirit substance is the absolute first cause without any constraints from outside its existence. There is no constraint from outside the spirit substance. And for Spinoza, here's one you've got to think about. There's also no outside existence of the good. In other words, uh, Spinoza didn't like the idea of uh, the old orthodoxy that said that that God uh, does all things in creation according to the good. Spinoza says he doesn't reference the good that is outside him, outside his substance. There's nothing outside his substance, so he doesn't reference the good. Uh, what emanates from the one spirit substance is to be affirmed, period. The uh, one emanating substance does not reference a realm of good outside of it. 
So we got to extend, understand that in his concept of extension, it really goes against the old uh, dogmatic metaphysics, and you got to remember that, that Spinoza does not support, and he got called a heretic, he did not support the old dogmatic metaphysics and the God, the, you know, the transcendent, omnipotent God that uh, referenced this good and then acted. Uh, no, the will of God is an emanating presence of thought. It's a, an extension. We live in this realm of extension. Now, the, the trajectory is one of necessity. And uh, God's omnipotence always remains the same state of activity. There's no variance in omnipotence. It's always the same, the same emanating power. The truth of essence equals the representations of the infinite intellect. And transcendence is actually God as indwelling cause, or spirit as indwelling cause. Transcendence equals spirit as indwelling cause. The attributes are the extended substance we live in. God's essence and existence are equal. The eternal equals all things that must always exist and always be infinite. Everything will always exist and always be infinite, period. Everything. Even the modality of the duration of our ideas, our thoughts, they are an attribute of God. They exist uh, because the emanating one substance even transcends any of our particular modalities of thought. So our modalities of thought are enclosed within the infinite attribute of thought. Our modalities of thought are enclosed within the infinite attribute of thought, of absolute thought. So our mode, modalities of thought are enclosed within absolute thought. And that needs to be understood because we are articulating this uh, phraseology of uh, substance as an ontology, and that's all done within this absolute thought. But we're expressing modes that can be revised. So, let's get into the uh, final aspect of ethics. So how does this all return to spirit? How do, we, how do we become spirit? I mean, from what we've said, we're going to become spirit, period. I mean, you can't, God can't counter God. Spirit can't counter spirit. There's no contradiction. There's no contingency. So what's going to emanate is going to emanate. Uh, that got him called a heretic. But, uh, you know, Hegel was called a heretic too. So, I mean... Let's face it, uh, that is uh, an all-inclusive view that does contradict the old metaphysics of the dogma of the church. So let's take a look at Block 3, substance returning to itself as conceptual phraseology. Number one, preservation. The God substance, the spirit substance, preserves the being of all things as conceptual phraseology. So for Spinoza... The writing is preservation. We write the phraseology of substance because that's the preservation of spirit. That preserves spirit. Writing it preserves it. Writing the concepts, writing the phraseology preserves it. So it's not a metaphysical system that preserves it. No, it's a human subjectivity writing it that preserves it. So you can see here the big shift which postmoderns also took up, the big shift from objectivity to subjectivity. The preservation of the infinite attributes is a work of human subjectivity. I'll say that again. The preservation of the infinite attributes of spirit is the work of human subjectivity. Swallow that, <laughs> swallow that one down, okay? Now, if you're a very radical, conservative, orthodox, fundamentalist, you're not going to swallow that. But understanding the whole thing here that uh, Spinoza is saying, we can understand what he's getting at. We're supposed to, the goal is to write this phraseology, and that preserves the truth. And if it preserves the truth, it helps, it is a writing of the truth that we share in a narrative. And by sharing it as a narrative, we help to move the narrative of the truth forward. That's, that's a good ethic, I think. You know, the Conceptual phraseology is a narrative of the notion of the true 
that we kind of got as a diagram in our head, but we have to put it into a narrative phraseology and we have to share it. When we do that, we persuasively, we persuade spirit forward. It's an ethic of persuasion. We persuade spirit forward because there's not supposed to be a contradiction of essence. If there's a contradiction of essence, it's because, hey, society, you don't understand spirit here. You're not seeing spirit. See spirit. See the spirit. We write the narrative of spirit and we share it as a phraseology that preserves the trajectory. Essence of thought, we are to write a phraseology articulating the active and passive aspects of the essence of thought. And uh, the active side are the uh, attributes of the emanating spirit. The passive side are the finite enclosure type modalities that we presently experience. Within those finite modalities, you have the um, active infinite attributes working. Now, we are to write this essence of thought, and I've got here the six elements of the essence of thought. Number one, we articulate the primary attributes. We must be articulated the immediate attributes of essence created through the proximate cause of the spirit substance. Number two, we uh, articulate trajectory or the teleology as a necessity of the spirit nature. The divine nature is going to evolve of necessity. We don't po we don't posit as a posit as something that could be constrained by contingency. It will evolve out of necessity. Where well, I've got the note where nothing is seen as contingency. Now three, we're to write this as an active nature working itself through a passive nature. The attributes that are working themselves through passive modes that currently enclose the attributes. By means of, we articulate this essence of thought by means of the intellect of understanding, according to Spinoza, which is part of the pass passive mode. It is part of the passive nature, but our passive thinking, our passive modes of thinking of the notion are enclosed within the attribute of the infinite attribute of, ab of absolute thinking of the spirit. That's why it has to be a process that Spinoza says is an activity of addition. We are continually, continually adding to the workspace of understanding to condition our volition. Uh, we reflect on nature through the primary attributes. And praxis is very simply taking up the process of the necessary and the impossible. A thing will evolve to its essence out of necessity, but it becomes an impossibility if there exists a contradiction of essence. But here's key for Spinoza. Contradiction of essence is subjective, not objective. It's a reflection of imperfect knowledge. If there's a contradiction of essence and something is not evolving to its true essence, it's because we're not thinking it right. It's subjective. It's a subjective problem. It's a problem of a non-converted humanity. It's the problem of a non-realized spirit because we're not writing the phraseology of spirit. Ultimately, for Spinoza, our conceptual phraseology of essence is to articulate nature as the affirmation of perfection. We are to articulate the affirmation of perfection. So you are looking at a very determined ontology of necessity when you get to Spinoza. An ontology of necessity, an ontology of one substance. And uh, we went about 40 minutes instead of 30, but that's going to wrap us up for Spinoza's ethics.